everybody. How you doing? I am Johan. That is Charleston. What's up? <laughs> <laughs> Joining us today, this guy is one badass motherfucker. This guy has <laughs> wrote books. His book, The Last Punisher, he's in New York. The title alone kind of <laughs> gets me intrigued, like The Last Punisher. Like, <laughs> the, yeah. He is a Navy SEALs, Team 3 Navy SEALs. He was a medic. He is also uh, an actor. A ho- he's you know famous Hollywood actor in this great show, American Sniper, which I've seen I think about sixty-seven times here. Join us today. He's also a uh, medical assistant. Join us today is Mr. Kevin Lace. Kevin, how are you doing, gentlemen? Good to be with you, Charleston Johan. Good to see you. Yeah, thanks for joining us. I know it's been a while. We're we've been trying to be able to connect for the last probably about. You know, four or five months, and Charleston was always going, man, just reach out to him again. And I was like, no, man, the guy's <laughs> killed people officially and has stated that. I'm not putting any pressure on his timeline. When he gets here, he gets here. But that's awesome. Thanks for joining us today. We want to talk. Yeah, you know how many times I watched American Sniper from, from <laughs> since then? <laughs> it's just, <laughs> <laughs> I'm truly, I, truly better with age. It's better with age. You know, the whole aging process to get me on here. So I'm happy to be on the show. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. That's awesome. Kev, we want to get into a little bit about all the aspects of your life, but let's begin with how, uh, let's talk a little bit about Kevin pre 9 11. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself before you, uh, <laughs> before that day? We'll talk a little bit about Charleston, where you were too on 9 11, but, uh, 9 11. Yeah. You were, 17 back then right you probably were around there but kevin tell us a little bit about yourself and and who you were pre-11 yeah i kind of went through some changes uh, i was a good kid i was a derelict and i joined the military and things got better but um you know i'm from from connecticut and uh much to the dismay of a lot of your listeners i am a bruins fan i used to be a whalers <laughs> fan until they moved to north carolina hey. That's and then I realized no self-respecting fan should like a team that plays hockey in the South. So, um, <laughs> oh, wow. move. Yeah, that was a pretty pretty ruthless way to start the show. But uh, no, uh, hockey, <laughs> hockey jobs right off the bat, you got all your Canadian fans just going, yeah, yeah. right, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so I'm from Connecticut, um, from a really small town. I was the oldest of uh, three boys, and you know, I did played a lot of different sports. You know, I played soccer, did basketball, baseball. Um, you know, went to a, went to an all guys Catholic prep school. It's a pretty you know typical upbringing uh, in New England, and I had aspirations to become a doctor. So, you know, when you're in Connecticut, the best thing about Connecticut is leaving. So <laughs> I applied as far away from Connecticut as I could. I applied down to uh, Virginia, down at James Madison University, and went down there. And, um, I, I failed exceptionally well. I, <laughs> I, I went from a pre- <laughs> I went from a pre med major to uh, beer, rugby, and girls. And I finished that first semester with a 0.7 GPA. So, you know, good student <laughs> up until that point, and then Whoa. terrible student. What'd you finish in the others? Uh, no, overall, it was a 0.7. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, 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 no. In the others, yeah, I was, I was a 4.0. 4. Yeah. <laughs> That's why, Kevin, when I was reading your book and get to know you, I was like, man, this guy and I are alike. You know, when we were younger. We were doing the rugby thing. What position in rugby did you play? I'm assuming you're a second row or a flank or an eight man. Oddly enough, I was a winger. Um, really? I have, have a little bit of speed. Probably, probably not like Charleston, but I got some speed out there. So I was a winger. <laughs> and I was also probably about 30 pounds lighter. So I was weighing in around 190. Um, nice. But yeah, I was a winger. I loved it. I'd never played, never played rugby before. Absolutely fell in love with the sport. And then all the other extracurricular activities that were associated with rugby were just <laughs> right in my wheelhouse. Um, but but yeah, you know, I, I took that very seriously. I took partying very seriously. Um, and I earned a, a GPA that was not so serious. And my <laughs> parents were kind of taken aback. They're like, you know, this is unlike you. This isn't stuff that you do. Um, so I doubled down. I told them, I was like, hey, give me a chance. I'll be more successful. You know, the following spring semester in, uh, in 2001 was okay. It wasn't great. And then, you know, I was told to go take summer school for some reason. I guess it was because of a GPA or something like that. And I spent the summer semester finally like working towards a good gpa and then uh come fall of uh 2001 you know obviously 9 11 happened and i was you know i woke up pretty much like i'm sure both uh, maybe you guys were like that on 9 11 but i woke up i was hung over i'd been partying the <laughs> night before we had a rugby party and i remember you know walking over the computer and i kind of like nudged the computer and you know the modem uh, the mouse moves and the aol instant messenger pops up and it says you know trade centers hit and i was like uh, that's terrible. I mean, I don't have any money in the stock exchange. I didn't know, you know, I wasn't investing <laughs> at the time. Yeah. 
And then my mom called me and uh, told me about a neighbor of ours named Bruce, a uh, family friend. He was in the South Tower. He had come down. He called his family. And then he said, he's like, hey, I got to go back. I've got teammates up in the tower. So went back up and, um, you know, long story short, never never heard from him again. But it that day had an impact on me. Um, you know, up until that point, I kind of felt like I was kind of like waffling around, wasn't doing too, too much with my life, going to school, checking that box, but not excelling. And in the months and weeks that went by, uh, I kind of rethought what I was doing. And I felt like joining the military was a uh, an appropriate uh, next step. And that's when I went to uh, the recruiting office and joined the Navy. Yeah, Charleston. And, you know, that's funny. You said that you're hungover rugby and, and hungover, uh, you know, like it's hand in hand. Right. Charleston, it, it was funny, um, Kevin. We were in we were in Saskatoon. I was living in Saskatoon at the time, which is just south of here in Regina. Um, and um, what happened was that we were having a rugby wedding that weekend on September 15th. And we were out the night before, too, what Kevin. What the hell is a rugby wedding? Well, it's just a, <laughs> any other wedding. <laughs> you drink twice as much and you probably fight some teammates and you get into bad stories. Well, rugby it, guys it, are crazy, man. Yeah, it's, a, it's a rugby wedding. And, and in rugby, you, you play against the opposite uh, you hate the guy on the pitch. You'll you'll do everything you can to win the game. After the game, you buy your opposite a beer, and it's awesome. And Kevin was a winger, which means he's fast. I was a winger too back when I was forty pounds lighter too, an inside outside center. But anyway, that uh, that September tenth, we were out because we had guys coming in from all over, and um, my coach was getting married, uh, and we were having the wedding was in Saskatoon, and we we're all out at Lydia's. I remember the night clearly. We're out at a bar, out till two in the morning, close it down, get home, order pizza, you know, pass out. Next thing you know, and I had a guy coming in from Vancouver, one of my, the scrum halves, he is up at 8.30, 9, you know, 7.30, he's up early, and he was watching this. And he was doing, he's trying to wake me up, Johan, Johan, something's happening in New York, something's happening. And, you know, I'm hungover, I'm kind of, what the hell? I didn't really think about it. I just remember watching it on the news, and you turn to CNN and all the Canadian channels, and you're going, Oh my God, look at this. And you you couldn't really understand the huge uh, impact that this would have. But where were you 9-11 and what do you remember about it? You got to think that's a long time for me. (laughs) And like, I got too many hits to the head. But but for the most part, I think I was in class and the whole entire school got put on pause and TVs went on. Everybody started uh, paying attention to what's going on. Like, everybody was, like, damn near feel, like, in defeat. Yeah. Like, everybody was heartbroken and, you know, calling their, their loved ones that were in the area or close to close to the area in New York or whatever. But, yeah, I was definitely in high school and I was in class. So it was it was weird. So, Kevin, you're, you're going through all this emotion and doing that. And that's what drove you to the military. So what happened next? What What was your... Next goal, did you know immediately that you wanted to go into the SEALs or how did that evolve? Yeah, I I didn't actually. um, I went to the recruiting office in Middletown, Connecticut and walked over to the Marine Corps because, you know, I'd seen the Marine movies before, Full Metal Jacket, you name it, Heartbreak Ridge, all the classics. And I thought the Marine Corps would be fantastic. Go General Infantry. Went to the office that morning and they had a sign, be back at 1300. They were out to lunch. So I was like, how convenient. (laughs) <laughs> so I walked into the Navy office and I saw a, uh, a poster on the wall. I had sea, air, and land, had a bunch of SEALs climbing out of the water with machine guns. I was like, that's pretty sweet. But back then, there weren't a ton of you know movies out there like American Sniper yeah. or yeah. books like The Last Punisher, right? Yeah, um, good so plug, good plug. I, I had to do a little bit of research. Yeah, it, you know, that's that subliminal marketing right there. <laughs> uh, but, but but yeah, so so I went in there with, you know, kind of no expectations and Really, that first time inside the office, I was able to, you know, you lay eyes on like what a career path would be in the SEAL teams. And the recruiter was like, hold on, son, you know, you don't just walk into the Navy and become a Navy SEAL. I had to do research and find out the the training process. But I knew at that point, you know, it was something different than what I'd been doing. I knew it SEAL team, the SEAL teams were, you know, the elite of the U.S. Navy and the U.S. military. Um, And it was time to, you know, kind of say, fuck it, let's go ahead and let's let's put throttle down and let's go full steam ahead and try and. uh, get to combat as soon as possible. I'm thinking like you watched the movie Full Metal Jacket and that's a crazy movie. Like <laughs> if you watch that movie, you're thinking like, 
hell no, I probably couldn't do this. I, I don't got the balls for it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Kevin always says that. I think you said, Kevin, once or twice, or maybe a few other guys have said this. That you, do you believe that you're made a Navy SEAL or you're born a Navy SEAL? A yeah, good question. Um, you know, I, I think it's one of those things. You always have those traits in you. And what SEAL training does is it kind of through, you know, the eight month process really, you know, erodes away all the fluff and gets down to the bare metal, the stuff that 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 you have within you that uh, kind of signifies, hey, you, you've had these traits all along. It just took, you know, this right circumstances to bring those attributes out. Um, and I'm sure Charles, same thing. You know, there's a lot of people that you know say they want to play in professional football, but, you know, they have that quality. You've always had that quality in you. You just had to be at the right place, right time, but then also you know, be aggressive, you know, yourself and prove that. And I, I feel the same way with the SEAL teams. I feel like those individuals are, have those skill sets, you know, they just need that push, that prod, whether by, you know, environmental circumstances, family circumstances to get them to the Navy and into training. Um, and once they get there, they excel. And I felt like up until that point, I had had failure in college, especially um, but once I got in the Navy and went to basic underwater demolition seal training, I felt like I thrived out there. It's crazy. How, it's crazy how that works because, like, I get kids and stuff, and they ask me, you know, um, you know, what'd you do? What did you do? How how did you make it to a professional sports? Like, was it something that you did as a little kid? Like, how'd you train? Like, what'd you do? And then I, I look at all the kids and I tell them, like, man, honestly, I didn't play football until. Uh, I was a junior in uh, 11th grade in high school. And to be honest, I sucked in high school. Like I was a terrible football player. Like I didn't find myself until I got to college to kind of like, okay, I started looking at all these other guys. Cause well, we came in my rook, my freshman year of college and all these guys are lifting weights and they've been in weight programs and my high school, we didn't have a weight room. We had one bench, one squat rack, <laughs> like three weights. So it was like, and everything was mismatched. So it was like, man, I came from like the gutter when it comes to like lifting weights. And I started looking at all these guys around me like, I got to get my shit together because these guys are way stronger than me. They're doing 225 as freshmen in college like eight times and I can't even lift it once. So you're a product of your own environment. Yeah, so, so you, you get in, yeah, you, you become the product of your own environment and started looking around like, man, I gotta keep up. It's either, <laughs> it's either fit in or fuck off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so Kevin, you get to the Navy SEALs. Now, one of the things that you, that you know you see in movies and especially in American Sniper is the the butts. Talk to us. Tell us a little bit about Bud's training. You get, you decide you're going to be a Navy SEAL, and then you you get into Bud's training. And for the people that are watching that don't know what Bud's is, Bud's, well, you can tell them. <laughs> you tell them what Bud's is, and how the hell did that treat you? I don't even know what Bud's is. Yeah, <laughs> intrigue, intrigue me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's not the it's not the California, Colorado, or Canadian Bud's that we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, um, exactly. It's, <laughs> it's basic underwater demolition seal training. Uh, so it's about eight months long and there's an 85% attrition rate. So, you know, eight and a half out of 10 people that started don't make it. And, you know, the, the first third of it is really the, the weeding out process. It's, um, you know, four mile time runs, it's ocean swims, it's paddling those rubber boats through the surf zone. Uh, that includes hell week, which is the fourth week of training or so. And that's uh, five and a half days long and you get a total of four hours of sleep per night. Now, I didn't know too, too much about SEAL training. I'd read a book. I read the book called The Warrior Elite, which is by Dick Couch. He's a former SEAL. And I felt that gave me pretty good insight. But really what gave me the best insight was I watched G.I. Jane. And I was so hoping that, <laughs> you know, I watched G.I. Jane and then striptease. I was hoping that when I got the buds, Demi Moore would be right next <laughs> yeah. to me. Yeah. Case. yeah, good try, though. Good try. <laughs> so you get... You know, wish, wishful thinking. <laughs> yeah. So you get there. How was Hell Week for you? Because, you know, in the movie American Sniper, you see the pictures. And the more you watch, everybody that's watching, when you watch American Sniper again, just watch how many times you'll see Kevin right beside Bradley Cooper. Or do that. I'm not sure if that was your play or um, Clint Eastwood's <laughs> play. but And it's awesome. You see, like, the first time I watched a show, I, you know, obviously I knew about you, but I didn't really clue in. Now, after that, man, you're every scene, you're right beside him and all that stuff. It's awesome. But let's tell us back to Hell Week. How did that go for you? Well, Hell, Hell Week was was good. You know, I I mean, I enjoyed it. It's you don't have to think. You just do. You know, Come on, like, man. You said you enjoyed miles. it. Yeah. 
I, I did, you know, because it's, you know, it kind of like what you had mentioned. Um, you know, I found, you know, that that resolve and I found that motivation when I saw people quit. Because when I got to SEAL training, everybody was just like me or better. Um, they were in shape, you know, they were highly motivated. And I was like, oh, shit, do, do I have what it takes to make it through if, if these 200 men, you know, are exactly like me and only, you know, maybe 30 of them may make it through? I was, I was really wondering. And once I saw them quit, I was like, I'm still here. Apparently I have it. So that's what <laughs> motivated me. Um, but, but there's one activity during Hell Week that you do a lot of. It's called surf torture, where they line the entire class up. You link arms, you walk into about waist deep water, and then you lay down and wait for the waves to wash you in and, and usually stop when somebody quits or they get cold. Um, so when it came to American Sniper, that was the last day of filming was that whole bud scene on the beach with Bradley. And we're sitting there, I'm reading the script and I was like, there's no surf torture. We need some surf torture in this movie. So I, I mentioned it to Bradley. Bradley's like, that's a great idea. He's like, tell, tell Clint. So I go tell the boss. I was like, Hey boss, I got an idea. This is what we can do. He's like, that's fantastic. He's like, how would you film it? And I was like, well, I don't know, maybe get a camera, get the whole line of people walking in the surf zone. And then what you really need is you really need that individualized camera that gets their facial expressions when the water <laughs> hits the face. He's like, that's a great idea. Well, take a bunch of actors that get paid a lot of money that don't get outside their comfort zone too, too much that they're going to lay in 58 degree Malibu water. And you could you could hear their assholes snap shut when I told them that's what they were going to be doing. <laughs> no shit. And it was, and it, 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 no, no. It totally made that movie in that scene. <laughs> no free beers from you from the actors after that. They're like, who the fuck signed us up for yeah. this thing? <laughs> <laughs> you see in those movies, you see on G.I. Jane, you see on American Sniper, you see on all the shows about that. Their lips are blue. You know, they're shaking. Everything is just hell. So, OK, so you survive Hell Week. What was next then with you after that for Buds? Yeah, so uh, finishing that, we went to second phase, which is dive phase. But actually, um, I suffered a back injury. We were doing a stealth and concealment. We were on the rib boats, uh, which are the rigid inflatable hull boats. And we had inserted in the beach, and then we swam back out. I think the waves were probably about you know seven feet or so. And I got back on the boat, and I was in the front of the bow, and we took off, and the boat driver was really hammering down on the throttle. And I got lifted off the bow of the boat, landed on my side, had another gentleman land on top of me. I ended up herniated, herniating a disc in my back. So I got medically rolled back in second phase with the next class. So I waited around for about a month, month and a half, and then joined up with class 246, which was dive phase. And, you know, being a swimmer, that was a kind of a fortuitous, you know, career change when I was in high school. I played basketball and my buddy's like, you should swim. I was like, I don't want to get, be caught dead in a Speedo. He's like, no, trust me, it's a good idea. You should swim. And sure, sure as shit, I ended up becoming a SEAL. And so swimming and water competency and just being comfortable underwater was uh, what made dive phase more enjoyable. It's hard, don't get me wrong. Um, you know, there's one exercise called pool comp. Uh, and the final phase of pool comp, it's a week long. And you start off like, you know, practicing ditching and donning your gear. Um, you have to, tr you know, you have to do the same thing with a blackout mask to simulate at night in, in darkness. Um, but the last phase of last part of pool comp is a, you know, it's, it's called, um, it's, it's the end of the week and you crawl around on your hands and feet at the bottom of the pool and the instructor dives down and starts ripping off masks, turning off your air, tying knots in your regulator hoses. And you have to, with lack of oxygen, undo all those knots and be able to get paid in air. And they do that about three times. And the last one is a really, they call it the whammy knot. And you have to ditch your gear, leave it, and then free surface up to the pool, top, the, the top of the water. And it just, it, it just finds out who's comfortable in environments where you don't have control. And that's, uh, I mean, it's pretty applicable to, uh, you know, a lot of different phases of life. You know, you have to be comfortable in situations that make you extremely uncomfortable. Yeah. Nothing goes, uh, nothing ever goes as planned. Right. And you always, uh, Man, uh, you do that to me. I'm drowning. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, how comfortable are you are you in the water, Charleston? Can you imagine that? What? I can't eat, I can't swim. I can swim good enough to save myself. Outside of that, I can't tread water. I sink to the bottom like a rock. Like I got a buddy who's been in the who's been in the Navy for about 13 years. And he went into the Navy not being able to swim, just like me. Never been in a pool, wasn't raised around water, Michigan. So never never been in boats, but I'm comfortable with water, but didn't know how to swim. And he learned how to swim from the Navy. 
I'll just put it like that. I don't know. I don't know what they do, what they did to him. Whether they took him and they tossed him in the water and said either swim or drown. Adopt. Well, yeah. Adopt and <laughs> overcome, better, right? Kevin, it adopt out. and overcome. How do they teach somebody how to swim who doesn't know how to swim? <laughs> Well, it's literally sink or swim. Um, but they, <laughs> they, they, in, in boot camp, they'll, they'll, they teach you how, you know, they do the jump off the tower, swim to the side, and then being able to swim the length of the pool a couple of times. Um, but it was crazy, though. If you look back throughout history, you know, the Navy was accepting a lot of people in like World War One and Two and beyond that just were non-swimmers. And obviously you can see the, uh, the issues with that. But, um, you know, they, they teach you how to swim through, you know, pool competency, and they'll do, you know, Saturday morning classes while you're at boot camp. Um, but being able to swim with clothes on, I think, is probably the most applicable talent you learn in, in boot camp. Uh, you know, a lot of Navy's stationed on boats. So if you fall off, you better be able to swim with clothes on. Now, Kevin, tell us a little bit about that story that I read in your book here about how you were out. Uh, you were swimming or I'm not sure if you had your gear on, um, but you were swimming and you got hooked on a fishing line. <laughs> And got yeah. that got hooked. Somebody was fishing, and they went down, and they caught a fucking Navy SEAL. You know <laughs> <laughs> you, what happened there? Like, talk about adapting and overcoming. You're just telling a story about that. What the hell happened there? I, I've been in a couple of uh, scuffles where I've been legit fish hooked, but I was <laughs> yeah. surfing in uh, Imperial Beach, and I was going down the line. And and what we normally do is, you know, on the longboard, you'd shoot the pier, so you'd surf through the wave, you know, through the pier. And catch it on the other side well i'm a big guy and i kind of wiped out so i get you know tumbled in the in the surf zone and i come up and i got hooked in the cheek with a fishing line and i look up and i could see the pole i could see the fisherman and i was like uh i better go <laughs> ahead and you know, get some tension on this or else he's going to go ahead and set the hook and rip my cheek out so i grabbed the line and i you know wrap it around my hand a few times and i'm still getting you know washed in the surf zone i've got the long board this 10 foot long board getting pulled in so I'm trying to get air. You know, I'm trying to bite the line. I'm trying to avoid, you know, getting hooked. And the whole time I'm thinking is like, shit, at least I didn't get hooked in the eye. Um, so I end, up, I end up biting this line. I walk up on, on the beach and my buddy's standing there. He's like, what the hell happened? I've got this hook with like two other hooks with bait on it and some weights. And I got the surfboard. He's like, Jesus. So we snipped it off, pulled the hook, got a tetanus shot and called it good. <laughs> Just another day on the beach eh, in San Diego. Wow. So let's tell us about it. You make it through buds. You're going through there. Um, and then you decide to be able or how did you then get into being a sniper? Because that's pretty elite when you're watching the show. Uh, you know, when you're watching the movie and you get into it or you talk about one of your great uh, teammates that you had, Chris that's Kyle. That's um, like one of my dreams. If I'm if I'm a joint, I want to be a sniper. <laughs> yeah, I, I know, feel like I'm one well, hell of a shot on Call of Duty. Yeah. I don't fucking miss. Yeah. <laughs> all the all the football players always go to Call of Duty, and you yeah. always see this. Hey man, you on Call of Duty? Then my sniper if, game is crazy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, let's let uh, Kevin tell us about how you got into then being a sniper, and the second part to that is tell us about your first night in sniper school. You and a buddy went out for a while, and then that, and then yeah. So being a yeah, go ahead. Yeah, being being a sniper was quite lucky, actually. Um, I finished SEAL training, uh, went to Army Airborne School where you learn how to jump out of airplanes, and then I went back for SEAL qualification. Um, and from there, I had to go to the Special Operations Combat Medic School where you know Navy medics, Marine Corps medics, recon medics. Um, uh, Ranger medics, Green Brain medics all go and learn how to become special operations paramedics. Uh, so I finished that course about nine months long, and then I got stationed at SEAL Team 3. And when I got to SEAL Team 3, the team was already deployed. They were in Fallujah. Um, they were in Baghdad. You know, they were out in the South Pacific, and there was nobody at the command. So they were like, hey, we're going to need some snipers. Does anybody want to go? And my buddy Jordan and I were looking at each other we're like, absolutely. They're like, one catch. You got to go to Army Sniper School. I was like, all right, I guess I'll go to Army Basic Sniper School. So we went to Fort Benning, Georgia, and, you know, it's two SEALs. We've got beards. The rest of the guys are Army guys, and this this course is like a high attrition course. You know, they're looking to fail people, and we show up. We've got all our guns, all our gear. The first night, what do Navy guys do the night before their PT test with the Army? They go out drinking. So we go to the <laughs> barracks. We're like, hey, we're going to go out drinking. Can somebody drive us around? And we must have like four or five privates in the army, but we'll drive you around. So <laughs> my buddy Jordan and I went down downtown Columbus, got hammer, hammer drunk. I mean, to the point where 
The next morning, like five minutes before the PT test, Jordan doesn't even wake up. I'm trying to pour water on him, hit him <laughs> in the face, trying to wake him up. And we we go to we go to the, do this PT test and the army test is like a two mile run, you know, push ups, sit ups, uh, pull ups, all that stuff. And I ran the fastest two mile time I've ever done. You know, hung over, puking, throwing up booze. <laughs> Jordan did the same thing. And, you know, sometimes you just have to preserve the myth, myth and crush it. Well, that's that's funny how you and Charleston can relate, because I know that we've talked about this on previous shows about how Charleston's getting ready for games. And, you know, you've been known to go and socialize before or I guess after two guys are trying to wake you up and they're where the fuck is Charleston? You know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> they, they, then the snapback come in and you're like, boom, and then you just fucking locked in. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's go time, right? When yeah, it's go. When it's go time, it's go time. <laughs> yeah. so you don't feel too good after that, but then, man, yeah. And and Kevin, during that, this is not an easy course. And if you fail this this uh, course, you're done. You're right. You gotta. You're you'd have to go back to uh, SEAL Team and and explain to them, yeah, I, I failed the 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 course, right? Like this is not just something that's a yeah. a, a nice jog in the park. Not only did I fail the course, I failed an army course, which, uh, you know, that, that doesn't look very good. <laughs> you go back to the team. So, I, yeah, you know, it, there's it's it's everything. It's not just shooting. You know, being a sniper is, um, you know, reconnaissance. You know, you have to be able to stay hidden in an environment for a long period of time and gather information because the prior to, you know, Iraq and Afghanistan, most snipers just did intelligence gathering. Um, so, you know, uh, memory recall, you know, uh, range estimation, just, you know, battlefield. You know, reconnaissance is an important tactic. Uh, learning how to use radios, um, uploading all that stuff to satellite communications are, are super important to being a sniper. And that's you know really a lot of the lion's share of sniper school. So I did the Army one, and then I did an abbreviated Naval Special Warfare Sniper School. Um, and that just furthers your skill set. Uh, but when we got to Iraq, you know, the use of snipers were so heavy that you know we weren't gathering as much intel. We were gathering intel, but it was more of the, you know, the, uh, the 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 use of a force when it comes to you know shooting and sniping um, and I, and I enjoyed sniper school it was a fun school but you know it's it's a lot of hours of laying on your stomach and shooting targets at you know a ton of distances but I'll tell you what Charleston Johan you guys would really love breacher school uh, Navy, Navy breacher school is gaining access to buildings that's from lock picking to using sledgehammers hooligan tools to chainsaws quickie saws you know using torches explosives now if you like breaking stuff that's your school and i absolutely excelled you know like kicking down doors blowing down sides of buildings like that was my jam and um i love sniper school don't get me wrong but when it came to breacher school and breaking stuff that was the best i think if i was ever to be in the military i think like charleston said you want to be a sniper that's what i would yeah, want to be i, still, I, I, I want to be, be the... a sniper man i don't know if I, <laughs> how i feel about going in and kicking down the doors and just breaching a room like that i know if somebody kicked the door down on me i ain't asking no questions i'm shooting <laughs> <laughs> well We'll get into all that after this. We'll come back. We'll talk a little bit more with Kevin about what it was like in Ramadi, when you went down there, how you got there, and the stories about that, as well as being, you know, a Hollywood actor. What was Clint Eastwood like? What was Bradley Cooper like? We'll get into that a lot more I know, right man. after. I got questions. I got a lot of questions. <laughs> got questions. I watch I a lot of war movies. <laughs> I've probably seen every single war movie out there and my favorite is Black Hawk Down. Yeah, yeah, well, we'll get into all that right after this. Hi, my name is Rob Peterson. I'm the broker owner of Realty One in Regina. Real estate and life is about great people, and that's why I'm associated with Charleston Hughes and Johan Zielinski and IKS to sponsor the Better With Age podcast. Realty One was founded in Regina 11 years ago. It's an independent brokerage, it's local, and it's full of great people helping great local Regina people buy and sell properties. It's entrepreneurial based, which means you have non-narcissistic agents that have your best interest in mind, not their own. In these coronavirus times, real estate market right now in Regina and Saskatchewan is thriving because people are thinking more local, they're not thinking about traveling because we can't, and that's driving our market. When you hire a realtor, no matter who it is, no matter what company, please interview them Please make sure they're a good personal fit for you because that's what this is all about. It's good people connecting themselves with someone that they know has their best interest in mind. And that's what the Realty One family does. And that's what a lot of agents in Regina do. But make sure you take your time and find the best fit for you and your family.
It's that time of year when divisions are decided, champions are crowned, and legends are born. Now, it's your turn to win big. You've heard the name just about everywhere, my bookie. They're the industry's leading online sportsbook and casino, and it's not hard to understand why. With thousands of lines to bet on all your favorite sports, NFL, NBA, and college ball, check, check, and check. MMA and soccer, they've got all the latest odds, period. Take advantage of MyBookie's prop builder and live in-game betting, where every single run, throw, and touchdown is another chance for you to put cash in your pocket. Visit their mobile-friendly website today and get your deposit matched halfway up to $1,000. Just use the promo code when you make your first deposit. The best part is they make it simple, with a variety of ways to deposit instantly, including credit card, bank transfer, Bitcoin, and more. Whether you're at home or on the go, on your laptop or on your phone, it's not too late to make your New Year's resolution a resolution to get paid. Bet, win, and get paid at my bookie. All right, and we're back here with Mr. Kevin Lace. Kevin, we were talking a little bit before the break about Sniper School, about that, about Ramadi. Tell us about how... You know, you get the call, you're going to Ramadi. What was the reaction like? And what was it like to get there? And, and Where the hell is Ramadi? Ask the man. Where is Ramadi? Yeah, so so Ramadi is um, west of Baghdad towards Syria. Um, and we actually, we, we didn't even plan to go to Ramadi. We were supposed to go to Baghdad and work, um, you know, the, the counterinsurgents mission there, uh, a lot of the Polish Grom, their special forces were working there. You know, a lot of foreign forces were working in Ramadi or in Baghdad, excuse me, um, just doing capture kill missions of, you know, uh, you know foreign fighters, um, you know, IND and placers, you know, sniper cells, et cetera. Um, but last minute, we kind of had an audible call and they said, you're going out west to work the Marine mission in Ramadi. And that was a unique mission because it was the one of the first times that, you know, Naval Special Warfare or SEALs and special operations would be used in conjunction with uh, the conventional troops to execute David Petraeus's, you know, clear, hold and build mission. So the goal was to clear areas, hold it and then build up infrastructure and push out. So we were going to go block by block and, and really, you know, change the way that you know warfare was conducted, because up until that point um, in a neighboring city, Fallujah, back in 2004, 2005, it was simply tell the women and children to leave. The men are going to fight it out, you know, the insurgents and the Marines and the Army. Um, but Ramadi was going to be different to help minimize collateral damage and really build that relationship with the locals and the local you know, chieftains and sheikhs and all that. Um, so it, it was a different mission, but it called upon a lot of our skill sets, which was, you know, sniper overwatches um, where we would oversee, you know, Marine patrols, Army patrols, you know, SEAL patrols into ba enemy battle space. Um, we also did a lot of our direct action missions, which are your, you know, kind of, kind of like uh, Charleston, you mentioned, you know, like Black Hawk Down, like show up in the middle of the night or the middle of the day and really just seize a target with a high value individual. Um, and then uh, another part of our mission was to train the Iraqi special missions platoon. So kind of, you know, we do the work, but show them with on the job training how to do it so that when it was time for us to leave, they could continue on that mission. So we had, we did multiple jobs out there and worked with multiple units, but the whole Clear, hold, and build was a new facet for American warfare in Western Iraq. So, how was that to be able to work with them? And basically, you're essentially teaching them, and almost like you're you're teaching them, you're 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 putting your lives with them, right? <laughs> how was that to be able to go in to you know their country and and to be able to lead them and teach them? You know, did you trust them? How easy was it to be able to um, you know because you're doing this over how long of a time? frame too that you got to go and you got to teach them to come on and and get in behind you or you know lead them and and teach them and you're going who the you know do you have did you know if they have any training whatsoever you know could they fucking hold a gun you know were they going to shoot you in the ass or what was you know what was that like scary um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. no i i you know what I, I gotta tell you this so we worked with some good guys um i mean there were some moments uh, i had a one of the Iraqi army, we call them Jundis. That's the name, Iraqi name for soldier. Um, you know, basically had an accidental discharge into a door, uh, about a foot and a half from me and a foot and a half from the breacher, Bob. Uh, and we thought it was incoming fire from the opposite room. So, you know, we took appropriate action. 
Um, but you know, there was stuff like that. You'd be standing there in line and, you know, you'd see a gun barrel like that and you'd have to push it away from your head, um, and, and let them know. But, but I did, I worked with a lot of guys that were, um, Shias, um, and they would live in Baghdad and they would take public transportation in Iraq from Baghdad all the way out to Ramadi, which is quite a distance. You know, it's, a, it's definitely a couple hour bus ride. And not only are they going to a different city, they're going to a different ethnic area. Um, so obviously, you know, sectarian violence was huge in Iraq at that time. So their commitment to the cause was there. You know, sometimes it was a little dubious. You know, you weren't really sure if they were, are they a bad guy? Are they Muj, which, which we called them Mujahideen, which is, you know, like religious fighter. Um, but for the most part, we worked with some pretty good guys. And by the end of our seven months of on the job training, you know, that, that, you know, those, those memory lapses and those, you know, um, suspect safety safety issues kind of went away and they were, they were executing missions more so on their own. So our, our job was done with, you know, teaching them and then the next SEAL team would pick it up and continue that mission. Yeah. So- I definitely got to be tough because your guard is up the whole time and you're like on high alert. I know I would be on high alert. So yeah. it's just, it's a hard job, man. It's a hard yeah. job. I'll yeah. tell you that much. So tell us a little bit about then about how, what was your first memory of going into combat? getting contact and having those bullets uh, fly around you. Because I know in your book, you mentioned a time about how um, you're sitting there and you're sitting in a chair and you, you take some contact on, you, you get off the chair to, I don't know how long, how much, like a few minutes later, or a few seconds later, that chair gets bullets and that chair and that table that you're on received bullets what the fuck are you thinking at that time? Or, you know, what was your first thoughts when you first came into contact with the enemy? Yeah, I realized that you can't think too hard. You have to run on instinct. It's like kind of like a running back. I mean, they've got a play route, but when they have the instinct, you yeah. know, take that seam and run, you know, they just do it. They don't think too hard about it. And um, the episode you're describing was we were operating north of Route Michigan, which was the main artery that ran through Ramadi. We were in marine battle space, so the Marines had that area, and our job was to you know, sit around this this traffic circle that there was a lot of IED and placements and provide sniper overwatch to prevent you know further bombs being placed in the road. And uh, it was early in the morning, probably around 9 o'clock in the morning, and um, I'm sitting on this table, and I'm you know, backed up from the window, and my f- sector of fire was down on the intersection. And you know I heard you know a couple snaps come in, and then a couple rounds came in the room, so I grabbed my gun, and I took some cover in the corner of the window down in the corner of the room rather. And, uh, next thing you know, my, my chair, my table that I was sitting in got lit up by machine gun fire. Then next, thing you know, an RPG came in and hit that window into the corner of the room and get the overpressurization. So it was just like, you know, like a running back. I found my seam, which was in the corner of the room, take some cover, get out of the, uh, get out of the, uh, the window where the bullets were flying through. I didn't have to think about it. I was like, you know, self-preservation <laughs> mode. Yeah. You know, I, I'm not going to get waylaid by, you know, 300 pound, uh, linebacker right now, but I make it <laughs> shot. So I had to dive for cover. Um, but, it, but it's normal. It, it, it's, it, it's it sounds, you know, kind of silly to, to talk about now, but it, it was normal activity. You know, I never sat back and was like, Oh shit, I came that close to dying. Yeah. Later on, when you're sitting back at your room playing, you know, call of duty or video games, you think about that. But in the moment it's like, Hey, this is a task at hand, you know, let's go ahead and provide cover fire. If we can't, you know what, get to a safe position, get some contact. Um, and then, you know, return fire when you can. And it was just a, a, day, a day-to-day occurrence. That's what I was going to say. Like when you, when you're like going through, or it's, it is the heat of the moment like that. And I know you can kind of relate it to sports because you go back and you're like, ah, how'd you get that sack? Or how'd you, how'd you throw that touchdown? And it's like, mm, I don't know. I really wasn't thinking <laughs> at the time. So it's like, you almost snap into a zone and then boom, it's like blackout mode. Like you just don't remember nothing you go into this kind of zone or this state of mind where you're just subconsciously reacting to everything that's thrown at you and you you don't get time to reflect about it and remember it until you like sit down and then ah, exhale relax damn that was crazy is that like the same kind of feeling that you're talking about where you're like Everything is so trained and drilled into you that you kind of react at the time and never even remotely take a time to think. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Obviously, we in the mission. You know, when it comes to you developing your 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 uh, 
your plays for the game and kind of how you're going to your scope of how you're going to approach that game. Same thing when it came to our missions, you know, we build our plan, but like they say, you know, no battle plan survives first contact with the enemy. And sometimes you have to be dynamic. Um, and a lot of the times you have to be dynamic because, you know, combat as in sports, as in real life is fluid, you know, nothing is really set in stone. So yeah, it's one of those moments you have blackouts like shit, what just happened? I forgot <laughs> what I just did. Um, but it's just, it's read and react. And I think that's part of the training that we did was, you know, they would give you your basic, this is how you clear rooms. This is how you clear buildings. But you know, the facades that they build in training are way different than what you're going to see downrange. And in order to be a good operator, in order to be a good athlete, in order to be you know, very successful in whatever business you go to, you have to be dynamic and you have to be able to read and react and adapt and overcome. And you're absolutely right. You know, you just get in the zone. It's like you do what you do because that's the training you've had. You've done the footwork drills. You know, you've done the the room clearings. And now it's time to execute. Yeah, Kevin, um, that's crazy. I mean, I love that. I think for me in business, I always um, say that I've always told this to my kids too and and everything is adapt and overcome, adapt and overcome. You're never going to be prepared for what's going to be able to hit you on any given day. Even if you have the greatest business plan or you have the greatest plan set out for you, you have to be able to just adapt and overcome and read and react like you said. So uh, speaking of reading and reacting, now let's get into this. Charleston's talked about some having some great teammates. You had some great teammates uh, along the way. And, in Ramadi and all throughout your military career. One of the guys, one of the stories in the book that really cracked me up is the fact that you had, you know, all these stories about war, it's, it's intense, it's high intensity, you have all this stuff, but you also had some guys like Ryan Jobs that was uh, nicknamed the Mad Shitter. Tell us why he got that nickname, and then we'll get into that. The, yeah, <laughs> you can get into having some good teammates and why they've played some practical jokes or things like that. But uh, Kevin, tell us about the story about Ryan and uh, and the mad shitter. It's, I, you know what? I'm so glad you asked me about Ryan Job and, and his nickname Biggles. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the mad shitter, because, because normally it's like, you know, Hey, tell me about Chris and all that. And I've had <laughs> awesome teammates like Chris. Yeah. Um, but, but Biggles, Ryan Job, you know, we would all get along with Ryan Job fantastically. So he went to university of Washington. He played rugby there, drank too much, oh, failed nice. out, became a Navy SEAL. So <laughs> if any of your listeners have like kids in college that are failing out and playing rugby, you yeah, know, they're probably going to become a Navy SEAL. Me and Joe did it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but yeah, so, so jo Ryan, he was the most unathletic person in the world looking, you know, you look at him, you're like, dude, that guy's not an athlete, but man, that was the toughest son of a bitch that I'd ever met. You know, he worked harder than anybody else. You know, those guys that like, you, know, you do like a practice or you do a workout and then, you know, they're back at it after everybody leaves. That was Ryan Job. Ryan Job would work harder, train harder than anybody else. He didn't look the part of a seal, but he was every bit a Navy seal um, and his work ethic and his talent level. Uh, but he was a devious motherfucker. Uh, we would get into some of these buildings and we'd set up to, you know, start our, our sniper hides where we would, you know, provide overwatch for whatever, you know, we were working with. And Ryan wasn't a sniper. So these were the most unfun ops to be on because he was a machine gunner. His job was to sit there. And if you know, bad guys tried a full front of assault or something like that, then he would start shooting. Otherwise it's just snipers doing their job. So what Biggles had devised was I'm going to go and find every single window that these snipers could potentially set up in. And I'm going to go ahead and take a giant shit right by that window. <laughs> so when they set up there and have to sit all day, there's a giant turd laying there. That was what Biggles would do. He would shit by these windows. <laughs> we got we got into this building one time, and I'll never forget. My platoon chief, Tony, he's from uh, he's from New Hampshire, huge Boston accent. And uh, he's, he, gets in the, he gets in there, and he was like, what the fuck? And he starts losing his mind because there's a giant turd right on the window. So I don't even know how Ryan got up there and like crouched up there to do this like turd right there, but he dropped a giant turd right by that window. It was dubbed the mad shitter. That's, that's, that's one of the things that when I was reading the book is I was going like, man, the Teals and, and teams, you know, when Charleston's told me some funny stories about the guys, like, I mean, Charleston, you told me some, you know, funny stories about the guys playing pranks and about how you had a former quarterback uh, from Texas. What would he do in the locker room? <laughs> that is fucking hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> it's like who 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 uh who thinks like that? Like, <laughs> but that, but that, 
<laughs> that's the fun like, part. But that's what I can relate. I was thinking about okay, what's no, the- yeah, but we had a, we had a, a quarterback named Cody Pickett, man, and he used to his dad was like a just a Hall of Fame rodeo guy, and and Cody was a rodeo guy too, and he was a quarterback, so you know he had extreme aim and precise precision on what he did, and he he was a roper, so he used to sit in his locker and laugh at guys walking from the shower and he'll start swinging that damn rope around. And as a guy's going by, he'll throw it down, boom, and he'll catch him at the ankles and rope a guy walking in his towel. So the towel comes off, the guy falls to the ground flying. You got meat flapping everywhere. So it's like- <laughs> she got that kind of mentality. It's funny. That's the same thing with the, with the teams and Ryan uh, Biggles, uh, Charleston, unfortunately, um, he was that type of guy, but unfortunately he passed away, uh, due to an, uh, um, I guess an operation he was in, right? Kevin, he was, uh, he, he was one of the guys that was shot in the movie American Sniper, right? In his orbital bone, did he get shot at Kevin or where was he shot? Yeah, he got, so on August 2nd, 2006, uh, we were doing a clearance, uh, you know, uh, cordon and clearance where basically the army was blocking areas off and Ryan was up on one of the rooftops with Chris Kyle with. Mark Lee with uh, um, uh, Johnny Kim, who was the other medic, and he was taking a knee on the rooftop and took a round through the wall, which hit the feed tray cover on his machine gun and and blew out his eye um, instantly. But that wasn't what got him. He eventually, through rehab, lost you know vision in both eyes because of the swelling in his brain and it affected his uh, his optic nerve and his good eye. Um, but it was the surgical revision, you know, a couple years later, three years later that that um, it took Ryan, it was the uh, kind of the, you know, the, the malpractice of, of the physicians that were working on him when it came to uh, some of the narcotics that were used. So Ryan passed, um, unfortunately, tragically, um, and, and never got to meet his daughter. His wife, his wife at the time was pregnant, mm-hmm. and uh, he'd called me like three days before the operation, um, was telling me he was going in for another revision. It, it was his like 25th, 30th surgery, um, and he was all excited because his wife was having a girl, and you know, he's talking about that and um yeah he, he passed in the recovery room um tragically three years after the event and, and oh wow and unfortunately you've uh, uh one last thing about ryan job is that i read that he also um he climbed a mountain blind didn't he uh be able to climb one of those mountains while while he couldn't see he actually went and climbed a mountain he did you know he he was a guy who completely you know changed his life and being a seal um, I think was was obviously a very positive thing in that direction. His wife Kelly is fantastic, um, but when he got out of the Navy, uh, medically discharged, he was he finished uh, undergrad with a 4.0 GPA. He climbed Mount Rainier blind. Um, he actually killed an elk blind, which I thought was funny. I, I, was, I always joked, I was like, Ryan, of course you killed an elk <laughs> blind because when you had two eyes, there's no way you could have hit the elk. You needed to be blind. To hit it. <laughs> yeah. uh, but but funny, funny story, you know. You know, Charles is talking about like, you know, team room and that. And this is what brings like, this is what makes like teamwork and unity is these stories. Cause uh, I, I remember I used to pick Ryan up, you know, after he was blind and I'd take him around town or I'd take him to a doctor's appointment. And he's like, dude, can you pick up some of the, uh, some of the Copenhagen for me so I could chew some tobacco? And I was like, dude, uh, absolutely, I can do that for you. No problem. He's like, yeah, cause every time I, I get some new Copenhagen, um, I try to hide it, but my my fiance Kelly, she always finds it. I was like, of course she finds it. You're blind. You're not exactly the best at hiding. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's so, awesome. Uh, but man, that, he's a, he's a funny dude. Funny I, dude. Uh, you know, a, a fun <laughs> drinking game. If anybody ever wants to play a fun drinking game, have a sip of beer or a whiskey every time Copenhagen or a dip is mentioned in this book. At one point, Kevin, I thought that you were sponsored by Copenhagen because Copenhagen and dips of chew come up quite a bit when you're in the, the apparently in the SEAL team and be able to do that, but that's awesome. Uh, you know- You're gonna be hammered in the first chapter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One of the things you talk about all these great teammates and unfortunately you've lost a few and you know we can go on for hours about some of the guys, you know, uh, like you mentioned about um, Chris Kyle, about Mike Monsoor, about you know, Mark Lee and all that stuff. Um, you know, how do you, how did you deal with, um, with losing them and to do that? Because unfortunately two Charleston's, you know, in 2016, Charleston lost a teammate to, uh, uh, there was a gunfight in yeah. Calgary where he lost a teammate in a bar. They were in a bar drinking and some of the guys, you, you, you tell the story. Well, it was just, 
Yeah, it was it was weird, man, because the guy was he was from Michigan, too. And, you know, we had I had conversations with him multiple times because he was training at the time to come to the CFL. And I didn't even know he was training to come to my team. But I gave him like a whole bunch of pointers and stuff, you know, beforehand about this, is what you can expect when you get to camp. This is how you make the team. Just kind of focus on that stuff. And he asked me questions about how is Canada? And I'm like, man, Canada's safe. Like, it's not like Detroit. <laughs> like, like you said, you go through 10 homicides a year here. In Detroit, you're going through 200 a year, 300 a year. So it's like totally different atmosphere. And I was like, man, Canada's is safe, like it's comfortable. You'll you'll be, it'll feel totally opposite from being in Detroit. <clears throat> and crazy thing is, is he ended up going to a, you know, some bar and ran into the wrong guy, really, is what it all boils down to. And bumped into a guy that, you know, he kind of was looking for trouble, one of those type of guys. And um, he actually even tried to, like, defuse the situation, bought the guy a drink. They had a drink together. But like I said, when you bump into a bad guy, you bump into a bad guy. And ended up, the guy ended up kind of provoking the situation even further after that and got outside, you know, the nightclub. And the guy came out and executed him, really. And, you know, it's crazy how stuff like that happens especially when you tell somebody that yeah it's a safe place you don't have to worry about no danger you don't gotta you don't gotta worry about watching your back you don't gotta worry about you know having that i guess that other sixth sense where or you're always alert about being in a party or being somewhere where like this place could potentially get shot up or this place somebody might have a gun in here or you always got to be very defensive about, you know, the way you approach people. Always having your guard up, right? Yeah, yeah and always and having your guard up. And I was like, it's not like that when you go when you go places, you know, in Canada. You can kind of let your guard down because nobody's really looking for trouble. But and then that know, happens. Yeah, then that happens. How, how Kevin, how, you know, what, what's your best advice for people to be able to overcome grief or overcome the situations? Because I know it hit you hard, obviously. Mark Lee was right there beside you guys, you know, and that, you know, coming home and, and hearing about Chris Kyle and, and, you know, you said that in the book, but or about all these fantastic teammates, friends, brothers you talk about. And Charleston, like you said, too, teammates, you just saw a few hours ago. How did you deal with those situations? Yeah, Charleston, I appreciate you sharing that story. And I'm sorry for your loss. Um, you know, I, I think when I was in the Navy, you know, especially in the SEAL teams, you know, you, you make that commitment. You, you volunteer to do a job that is going to put you in harm's way. So I always rationalized it and made peace with the fact that, you know, the men I served with who passed, um, you know, they died doing something that they wanted to do, that they loved to do, surrounded by people that they wanted to be with. Um, so that that's the way that I, I dealt with it. And, you know, with especially with Mark Lee and, and Ryan and Mike Munsoor, you know, their, their last action is not death. You know, their last action is that gift of life. And I've met, you know, so much more of their families that I never would have met had they been alive. So, you know, it's a bittersweet, um, you know, result from it, but obviously, you know, tragically when we lose anybody, it's terrible. Um, but I take solace in the fact that, you know, you get to meet their families and, and become closer with their families, which is, you know, one of the, the saving graces to it. Um, you know, and, and, and losing Chris was difficult, obviously for a lot of different reasons, because like Charles, you were, you were mentioning, um, you know, Chris was murdered. Um, you know, he, everything's in safe. He's in Texas. He's back home. He's not in the military anymore. Uh, you know, he's with his wife and kids. He's doing it, you know, an honest day's work. And, you know, he just ran into a bad dude. Um, he ran into a bad dude on a bad day who had one motive, and that was to do harm to not only Chris, but also, you know, Scott Littlefield. Um, so, uh, what, what do you do? Um, you know, I think you, you obviously grieve, you know, that's obviously the, the human nature to it. You grieve, you know, you miss your loss, um, but you move on. And I think with Chris and his family, like I've gotten to know and Chris's parents, his mom and dad, Debbie and Wayne, um, I said, Scott Littlefield, excuse me, Chad Littlefield, um, yeah, Chad Littlefield's family, uh, Chris's brother, Jeff, and, and really, you know, they, they connect you to so many more people in life that you probably would not have had a relationship with. So, you know, obviously, it's terrible losing somebody, but I think there's always, you know, there's a silver lining to it. And, and the gift of death is always rewarded with the gift of life and the people that you meet based on that person's passing. Yeah, well said. Well said. Um, let's talk a little bit. I know we're running out of time, but I just want to talk a little bit about 
Um, do you get bugged now that you're Hollywood? Do you ever get the nickname Hollywood now that you're an American sniper? And how is that to work with the great Clint Eastwood and Bradley Cooper? I've been I've been very fortunate. You know, I, I, I was not an actor. I didn't do any drama classes. I played sports. I fought. You know, so so when Bradley, when I was training Bradley Cooper on the range, you know, about four months before, I didn't four months, maybe like three months, two months before American Sniper. And he's like, hey, hey, Kevin, we need to get you in the movie. We need you to act and play yourself in the movie. I just about, you know, fell out of my chair laughing because I was training him how to shoot. I was like, no, man, let's get your character right. And then we can worry about me. Um, but it was, you know, just just sheer luck. Uh, you know, you can spend a whole career, you know, wanting to be in, in Hollywood. And, and that just happened to, to come about, you know. Because Chris was supposed to be the guy. Chris was supposed to be the guy who would train Bradley and, you know, and support that role. But with his passing, you know, sometimes you, you need to step up. And that was an opportunity. So working with Bradley is fantastic. I, like I said, I worked with uh, Michael B. Jordan on Without Remorse, mm -hmm. which comes out soon. And, uh, you know, both those guys, Bradley, Michael, you know, are just top notch actors. So when you teach them something, they learn, they understand, they do the prep work prior to the role. So they don't walk into a green. They've studied these people that they're going to represent for months and years um and clint eastwood i mean i mean it's clint eastwood he's not going to make a bad movie so <laughs> working with that guy was like it's like I, I don't know it's like finding yourself you know being coached by bill belichick or something like that you know it's it's it, it's the he's the man um and you know clint was fantastic to work with he just has a sense he, he was made to be an actor made to be a director and his um, his crew that he works with shows he has people that have worked on his crew for 25, 30 years because that's the type of individual he is and the type of leader he is and the product he delivers is always top notch. Did he, Does he even smile? I feel like Clint Eastwood always had the same face the, expression the growl. all the time. Yeah, yeah the, he always just like this all the time. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. It's funny. So we're I, I haven't told this story very often. So we're in Morocco. That's where we filmed uh, part of Sniper in the beginning. And we're sitting there after a day of filming and we're up at a bar and it's, you know, it's Clint, it's, um, you know, a couple of the producers, you know, the assistant AD and all that. And Bradley and Bradley's wearing a Cassius Clay, you know, the Coca-Cola shirt that says Cassius Clay. He's got that yep. shirt on and Clint sees him from across the bar and kind of like looks at him and sneers and he pops up out of his chair. And Clint is, he was 84 at the time. And that guy <laughs> hopped up by the chair. He did a dip by the chair faster than I'd seen anybody do that. And he walks on over and he looks on over. He's like, what's up with you motherfuckers? And I was like, oh shit. And so he sits down. I'm like looking at him like, oh shit. And then we're sitting there and he starts, I'm not going to do his voice the whole time, but he's sitting there. He's like, yeah, Cassius Clay. He's like, I know that guy. I knew that guy. Good motherfucker. He starts telling this story. He's like, yeah, I'm in Memphis at a party and I'm at this party and, and Muhammad Ali's there and he makes eye contact with me from across the bar He's looking at me, give me the evil eye, and I'm looking back at him, giving him the sneer, and he looks at me, and he points to me, and he says, downstairs. So I start walking downstairs, and Clint's telling his story. He's like, we walk down the stairwell, down this other stairwell, all the way down to the basement, and he's like, and we meet up. And there's one light in this dark basement between me and Cassius Clay, and Cassius looks at me, and he's like, Clint, you got a problem with me? Oh. <laughs> and I'm sitting there, I'm like, Muhammad Ali was nervous about being around you. He's like, yeah. He goes, you got a problem with me? And Clint's like, no, why? And Cash is like, oh, cool, man. I just want to make sure we were cool. Now, he's telling me the story about him and Bob and Ali, the two icons. Yeah, having like, a fucking stare off. Clint, Clint's a bad motherfucker. So Cash is like, so, uh, so yeah, so that was, that was a cool story. But just listen to him tell stories of, uh, you know, he was he was in the army. Um, you know, he was supposed to go to Korea, got into his plane crashed. He actually swam from the crash site back to shore. And they were like, man, you're a pretty good swimmer. You shouldn't go to Korea. You should be a lifeguard. So we spent his time as a lifeguard in the military. <laughs> wow. <laughs> eh? How that changes yeah. someone's life. Wow. That's, that's crazy. crazy. Exactly. <laughs> so the, cra the crazy part is, is you you've trained all these actors on, you know, I guess how to portray uh, a, a military or a sniper or, or whatnot. Can you put Johan through like a, a basic training course right now of like how you would train these guys? Like, like what's, what's like the beginning phases of, okay, how do you take a guy like Johan well, first and, and put off, him, what is, what put does him that into even a sniper boot? A guy like because Johan. it's not me. I already, I already have the, the mean streak. <laughs> But <laughs> I want to see. I want to see how would you train Johan right now to be a, a Navy SEAL? 
Well, first things first is Charles. I'm gonna make you a guest instructor. So you're gonna get a bullhorn, and you're gonna get a hat and a shirt, and we're gonna do this together. We're gonna put him through seal training. We'll do some like log PT. We'll make him do some surf torture, some cold therapy, um, and just run them and just break them to the, bring them to the point of tears. So I think we can make that happen. All right, boys, I accept that challenge. If you'll accept mine after, then you gotta drink with me because I drink for a living. I have been selling <laughs> booze here in Saskatchewan for 20 years. So I'll do your shit. I like challenges. I'll take it on. I've seen all the movies. I'll get trained up. I'll do my pull-ups, Kev. I'll do, I got my son, my 15 year old, doing the, um, the kicks, scissor kicks for his abs. We do a routine, we do that obviously, the booze is still stuck around in some of my areas, but I'll accept that challenge for both of you boys, but you got to come drink with me afterwards <laughs> and then do that. So. Is, there, is there a certain lingo he has to talk? <laughs> lingo? What do you mean? <laughs> yeah, we're we're going gonna, we're gonna to break them on down and we're going to build them back up. Yeah, we're gonna <laughs> yes, sir. No, sir. Roger that. Check. I, check. I, I yeah. like this. I Copy. Like this. Check. Yeah. All right. Okay. I'm in. I'm signing up for that. That's for sure. Uh, Kevin, well, we really appreciate everything that uh, you coming on the show, taking your time to be able to do that. Um, anything you want to talk about? I know that you have a foundation you have with your wife who does so much of your work. I got to thank her for uh, I know I got an autographed copy of your book um, a while back. And she basically she set all of this up with the emails back and forth. And she's uh, busy. What do you have upcoming? Can you tell us a little bit about that? About uh, possibly yeah, your the foundation? Yeah, or? and your foundation. What do you have going on? Yeah, well, uh, my wife keeps me in check. She basically tells me what we're gonna what we're gonna do and where we're gonna go. They all um, do. No, yeah, seriously, she, <laughs> she, she she is integral to the process um, and, and everything we've been doing. She knows she was a co-writer with the Last Punisher, um, which was her addition to it. You know, made that book uh, successful, and I really really mean that. Um, so she and I launched hunting for healing, which is our 501 C three nonprofit where we take injured veterans and their spouses on hunting, fishing, outdoor activities. And our goal is to get them outside of their day to day in areas where, you know, there's no cell phone, there's no computers and allow them to connect. And we found that transitioning out of the military can be difficult if you don't have that person with you to connect with and being able to communicate and stay open with. Um, cause when you're in like, you know, if you, if you plan a team or you're working full time, you know, in a career, um, or you're in the military, you know, you have that support network at work with you. And when you leave that, you know, you tend to go back to your hometown you go somewhere different and you don't have that support network. So we found that by outdoor activities, hunting, fishing, outdoor activities, making that bond stronger between the spouse and the veteran ensures success in that marriage. And then that person's you know, success in transitioning from whatever career fields, in this case, the military and beyond. So hunting for healing has been in place for a number of years. And uh, we do a lot of trips, um, you know, here in Florida, fishing trips, we've been hunting in Africa, we've done fishing in Costa Rica, we sent a trip, a trip down to Argentina, um, and then all throughout the US hunting and fishing. Um, so our goal is to improve that communication. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we have a new book coming out, which kind of ties on that. I have a copy here, it's called uh, the veterans workbook, how to transition out of the military and get hired. And, you know, through my trials and tribulations, getting out of the military and going back to school, I kind of just put that down as a handbook on how to, you know, go through school and, and what you need to do on your own, you know, preparing for job interviews and the career that you want. And, you know, basically dealing with a lot of stuff and, and the bullshit that you just don't expect when you're getting out of the military. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's, that's crazy. Then all those, all those are very beneficial and very much needed, especially because I had a, a cousin who was in the army, he was in the uh, in the military and he ended up getting deployed back home because he got hit by a, a roadside IUD or I think it's called IUD, right? Yeah. Bomb. Roadside bomb. No, the, 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 yeah. IUD. IUD. Yeah. 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 See, IUD. See, I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, like, but yeah, he ended up getting uh, hit by a roadside bomb and he's like partially deaf and partially blind in one eye. And Man, he was like seriously mentally impacted from that for a long time. And he's doing good for himself now. And I think he's recovered, you know, fully and, and mentally. But it, it took him a long time to get like his bearings back, get his marbles back, like start, you know, trusting people again, start being able to drive a vehicle like like everything, like it damn near hit reset for his whole entire life. That's awesome that some people now, Kevin, through your book and through your work, have a way to be able to find transition 
I think that's key. And like you mentioned, Kevin, that doesn't have to just mean, I think, the military too. Just everything in general. With COVID, there's been lots of layoffs and you have people really with mental health issues because they don't know how to be able to transition into something else, right? They don't know what to do, what's the steps. It's, it's really, um, I, I can imagine that your book could be able to be similar to all kinds of situations for people to be able to know what are the steps to be able to take, right? What the hell do you do? You're, At least the you're, outreach for people to get help. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, my, my day-to-day job is I'm a physician assistant. Um, so I work with a, a doc down here in Florida and we do performance medicine and it's very it's not uncommon to see whether it's you know athletes football players you know whether it's you know mm. people that are in certain careers when you leave that community you know it's a life change you know you're so used to doing something for so many years like what do you do next and you know it has its physical tolls it has its mental tolls and you know you're just your 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 bubble shrinks you know your network shrinks when you leave that community and and our goal with you know hunting for healing is to improve that communication the goal with the book is to and kind of navigate that so you don't end up in one spot for too long because you have to continually progress. And, you know, sometimes like Charleston, you're mentioning some of these you know, battlefield injuries take years and it's important to have a network in place at home to deal with those things rather than struggling and trying to go it alone. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, Kevin, uh, for everybody watching, go out and get his book, The Last Punisher. Go out and get his I new know, book. I know where I get that shirt sure that kill, kill bad dudes. Yeah, we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll definitely put the links on there, too, to be able to support that. It's one badass shirt. This is one of Kevin's shirts, too. You can go and where can we find this? Uh, some more information about all your, uh, your foundation and uh, stuff like this, items like this where we can get. Sure, yeah. So the, the foundation is Hunting for Healing, huntingforhealing.org. And uh, all the T-shirts you can get at uh, KevinLace.com. That's K-E-V-I-N. So that shirt there that you got on right now? No, that that one's separate. That's my buddy over uh, at Half Face Blades, um, Andy Arabito. Uh, so it's basically We KBD. We kill bad dudes. Um, I think it's a way. We KBD at dot com. I think is where you can get that shirt at. Um, but yeah, it's a it's, it's a pretty awesome shirt. I'm not gonna lie. Next, next show, Kevin, uh, I'm going to go order two, one for Charleston, one for me, and then we'll send you a little picture of us doing uh, our next show with uh, with that shirt on. So, Kevin, really has been an absolute pleasure. We hope uh, we can stay in touch. Please do. Uh, if there's ever anything we can help out with, um, please let us know. Yeah, but let us know when you come back come, up goose hunting yeah, in Saskatoon, come up, man. Come up to I'll Canada. Come on and visit. Come have some real beard, be able to do that. <laughs> but how we always end the show is we feel that uh, we get Charleston to say these last uh, parting wise words, I guess you can say. Yeah, that was awesome, man. Awesome to hear your story. Awesome to uh, kind of listen to you. Talk about the the good and the bad about, the, about back in the day, you know, from 9-11 all the way up until now and, you know, training with, Michael B. Jordan and people like that <laughs> who are going crazy when it comes to like acting in movies. But this is the Better With Age webcast. And the reason we call it the Better With Age webcast is because there's many things that get better with age, buddy. Not only just you, but me <laughs> and Johan, we both get better with age. But there's whiskey, there's wine, there's cheese, there's leather. But out of all these different things that get better with age, the most important of them all is friendships. And now that you've been on the Better With Age webcast, you are one of our friends and we're going to keep you in mind all the time. When we rock those nice shirts, hopefully you got one that can fit, you know, my (laughs) my great Greek body. (laughs) But But heck yeah, man. But it was awesome having you on the show. You know, it's all fun and games, but that was a great story. I can't wait to get a chance to read this, The Last Punisher book and uh, the new book that you got coming out. Make sure you go out and grab that, all you viewers and listeners that are listening today. But thank you for coming on the show, man. I appreciate you guys. Thank you very much. All the best, Kevin. Take care. Thank you. Holla!